everyone. Welcome back to the show. I hope you're all doing well and enjoying the summer. Today, we have a pretty big show coming up, and I'm super excited about it. We're going to talk about the Trudeau government's recently suspended federal vaccine mandate as it applied to travel and to the civil service. Trudeau and company always claimed that they were following the science and the evidence, uh, but we now know, at least for the travel mandate, that's simply not true. On August 2nd, I broke a story for Barry Wise's Common Sense, where I report on recently released court documents relating to a case challenging the federal travel vaccine mandate. These documents make it abundantly clear that the mandate was not motivated by the science. I encourage you to read the story uh, for all the details if you haven't already done so by going to commonsense.news. So today I have three very special guests with me. I'd like to introduce you to the two plaintiffs in the case, Sean Rickard and Carl Harrison, and their attorney, Sam Presfalos. I'm delighted to have them on the show. Both Sean and Carl were born in the UK and came to Canada as immigrants many years ago. They're both entrepreneurs, and they were both pretty upset about the travel vaccine mandate. They felt it was unjust and wanted to challenge it in the courts rather than lying down and just accepting it. Sam is a Toronto-based attorney who is fast developing a reputation as one of the smartest and sharpest litigators in the city. He's only 30, if you can believe it, and he's already making waves in the legal community. So on that note, I'd like you to welcome Sean, Carl, and Sam to the show. Sean, Carl, and Sam, um, great to have you on my show. Um, it truly is a privilege to have the three of you with me. I believe this is your first media appearance since the story broke. Uh, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just delighted to have the three of you to talk about the case. Uh, I want to start with Sean and Carl. Um, I want to ask you what uh, motivated each of you to take on the Canadian government and challenge the vaccine mandate. Um, you know, I've written about this and you also know this courts in Canada tend to be very deferential and there's always this uphill David versus Goliath battle going on. So I'd love to know what motivated each of you and how did you both get together in the first place? Um, and uh, and if you could go into how the mandates also affected you personally, uh, that would be great. So um, Sean, if you want to start. Yeah, I mean, I, I initially started, um, I, or, or what sparked my um, anger and interest, interest in this was um, initially when the when they started talking about the mandate uh, i mean I, I like to travel as most people do i also have family in england and uh, the more they they started to sort of um that, that whole rhetoric about not being able to travel get on a plane or a train um really concerned me and uh, i mean i spend a lot of time in cuba fishing and so on over the years and um to me what they were going to be attempting to do kind of resembled that somewhat. I, I, I have friends in Cuba and I see how they live and how they're not able to leave the country. And it really terrified me and, I, and it angered me. So I initially um, started reaching out to a few politicians and uh, one of them being Roman Baba. And to keep the story short, I, I had a conversation with Roman. Um, he was very helpful, very nice man, very supportive. And uh, we had a great chat and he then put me in touch or he, he gave me the contact information for Sam, who, who we knew. So um, right after our, my conversation with Roman, I contacted Sam. Uh, we kind of hit it off right off the bat. And uh, Sam was as passionate about this as I was. And uh, we kind of back and forth a little bit on a strategy and how we might do this, knowing that we would need to raise money um, to go to court in Canada, as you know, and the federal courts is very expensive um even even with um even with sam's um reduced rates it, it, it's it's a costly process so we i immediately after i got off the phone with sam started a at that point a gofundme fundraiser and i think within a few weeks we'd raised about fourteen thousand dollars um and we would i was promoting it prim primarily through twitter at that point um, <clears throat> as soon as I started making traction on Twitter, for some reason, Twitter canceled my account. I'm still permanently um, uh, banned from Twitter. I, I have no account there. And the same with LinkedIn. But uh, long story short, I got um, chatting with people online. A lot of people were very supportive. My, my 
my followers grew very quickly on Twitter, like ridiculously quickly. I went from like four followers and then six weeks I had 7.8 thousand followers and then my account crashed. But during that time, I, um, Carl actually reached out to me through Twitter and then a lot of people were doing so at the time because of what we were doing. Everyone was worried what was going to happen. You know, if they're not vaccinated, they're not going to be able to leave the country, travel across the country, visit, you know, sick relatives or whatever. And, and Carl and I got talking and um, we eventually, I think it was like on our, we back and forth, I think about three times, Carl, on Twitter, right? <clears throat> Through messaging before they got rid of my account. And then we set up a Zoom call with Sam and we, we all headed off and um, Carl had uh, very kindly agreed to, to help us finance the case as well. So we, at that moment, again, just it was, it was just like a natural it was a meant to be moment where we all came together and we went off on this journey. And within two weeks, we had filed the um, application with the federal court on December 24th, 2021. And then I'll let Carl tell you the rest of the story. Okay. <laughs> no. um, yeah, I mean, my, my interest in this kind of probably started in the summer of 2021. We'd, previously in the spring, we'd heard the prime minister using the language you'd expect right you know the uh, regarding the 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 vaccines and the you know if you if you were canadian and you wanted one there'd be a vaccine for you and that sounded like normal language to me as soon as it got to the declaration you know the dis dissolution of parliament and the start of the election campaign in the summer of 2021 then the language just pivoted it pivoted 180 degrees and suddenly became um, very hostile towards Canadians who had probably relied on the earlier words he'd said and had made their choice and they maybe were not sure yet about having the injections or or maybe didn't want to at all for whatever reason and suddenly these people became people that no other Canadian would want to sit next to on an aircraft or and the language became very hostile there were a couple of speeches I noticed he did on the stump when he was out campaigning and, and coming from Europe you know we've kind of heard this sort of language before um from leaders there this you know you don't expect to hear it from a canadian prime minister i don't think i think that's that was the first shock that really you know rattled me was hearing those words come out of the mouth of it out of the mouth of the canadian prime minister that sort of hostility um whether it was a campaign tactic or whatever i don't know but anyway he decided to do that and did it and and I thought, well, this sounds like a, a very bad idea that they're going to bring in. So my attention was up. And then when they brought it in, I think October, November of 2021, then um, clearly it was, you know, you, 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 you have three choices. And, you know, you with these political uh, policies that, you know, that attacking and hostile political policies, you can either accept them you can fight against them or you can leave run away maybe there's a blend of those but i thought well i brought my family to canada I, I fell in love with king canada in the 1990s and i brought my family to canada 10 years later um didn't see any reason i should be running away i'm not prepared to accept that kind of blatant discrimination um against canadians including myself so the option you have is to do something and fight. And we're not in the political sphere. Um, direct action and protesting is another one. You join in with everybody else and do that. But legals, some form of legal action is the third strand of, mm -hmm. of that. Um, so I thought, well, I've done that before. I've taken legal action before in not same circumstances, but have some experience. So I thought at least I can bring that. And I, on Twitter, I saw Sean's um, words, and that they, his words resonated very much with me. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, I didn't know he was a an ex Brit. <laughs> I, well, I, I'm actually just to clarify, I'm still a Brit. I'm a permanent resident here. Oh, so. I've been here 35 years. <laughs> and I'm actually I, my, my. I probably shouldn't say this because they might kibosh this for me. But um, I, my citizenship is actually in process right now. So. 
I'm a British <laughs> citizen um, and, uh, and a permanent resident. Charles, you're dual citizenship. Uh, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm a dual. I became a citizen of Canada in 2015. 15, I think. Yeah. 2015, yeah. yeah. So, so I saw Sean's and reached out to Sean, and I thought, well, you know, I, this guy seems to be doing something really positive, and um, I'm going to reach out and see if I can add to that. You know, mm -hmm. and see what what I can bring that that's useful and helpful. So that's how I got involved with Sean, and that was how I started. My, my interest yeah. came from yeah. through Sean. I mean. Um, I met uh, Sam and, you know, I, I got to say this, I mean, I, we hear the prime minister use words, you know, he tells, he's used the stepped up phrase, God knows how many times, he, you know, all the time. He's used that about people stepping up and, and Sam was one of, at that time, one of the few lawyers I'd seen that had stepped up and I was really impressed with that. Um, and, and, I, uh, and we all got on well, very quickly. Yeah, I can see that in my interactions yeah. with the three so of you. So that, that's how I got involved. I offered to <laughs> finance it with him. And, yeah. Um, I, I, I think another important point was that the, yeah. the fact that the, the that had me worried, and, and again, scared even to, to an extent, was <clears throat> nobody else was doing anything. Mm -hmm. There were yeah. no politicians speaking yeah. up about this. I'd never I'd never in my life imagined tyranny. Pardon Roman Babo was, wasn't he? I, oh, you know, Ro yeah, Roman. He was one of the only people. Yeah, that's speaking. Roman I had the conversation with. Yeah, so yeah. I exclude him from that because he was very helpful. But in general, in the media, um, any of the political parties were, were really doing nothing. <clears throat> and I felt that somebody had to do something. Um, no matter how we did it, we, we would make it happen. And, and we, you know, we kind of did. But that that's that's concerning when when you've got both the opposition and the governing party, and nobody's nobody's speaking up about it. Like, where were the conservatives? And anyway, we won't get into a political argument, but that yeah. really worried me. Mm -hmm. No, that's uh, it. It was pretty worrying, and um, and you know, I, I was also really taken aback back by the fact that unions in this country backed the vaccine mandate. It's extraordinary. I think in the UK, for example, the unions vehemently opposed the uh, the you know whatever mandate was being proposed. But here in Canada, everybody was just in lockstep with the government. But um, you know, I want to turn to Sam here. And uh, Sam, I want to ask you, how did you get involved in this case? What's you know what's the backstory and what drew you to this particular case? Is something you wanted to champion? Actually, uh, for a while, I've been wanting to take on a travel related case. And the first travel related case that I wanted to take on was the hotel quarantine. Um, and quite frankly, actually, the hotel quarantine case is the case that for the first time ever piqued my interest in public law. I'm not a public lawyer. I'm not a constitutional lawyer. Uh, quite frankly, I think constitutional law is my lowest grade in law school. Uh, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a corporate commercial litigation lawyer, and I just deal with businesses, and I deal with real estate, and, and so on and so forth. So I am not in, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in Terra Nova here with respect to these types of constitutional challenges very much. But having said that, there's a lot of principles I apply in what I do with my, you know, corporate commercial files uh, here, and, and and hopefully that will bear some success. But I got involved because. At a certain point, I felt uh, that there is a disconnect between the public health measures that were being taken and the degree of risk as I understood it. Now, I'm not a doctor. I'm not qualified to speak about uh, you know, the degree of risk of COVID, but as a lay person, I'm qualified to form my own lay opinion on it, and that's exactly what I did. Mm -hmm. And then when they started targeting the transportation sector in what I felt was a fairly disproportionate way, and then it escalated to the point where, as a Canadian citizen, the government is telling Canadians that they need to go to a you know a defined location for a defined period of time. Uh, that's kind of you know I felt like we're kind of sort of crossing the Rubicon there. So that's that's really what uh, inspired me, I guess, to to start getting involved in these actions. And in fact, I, for the first time ever, for in a long time, I should say actually, as I proactively reached to Roman Baber's office. I said, look, I'm a lawyer. I don't know how many lawyers are contacting you, but if you have people that have cases with respect to the hotel quarantine or other interesting kind of public um, interest cases, I'm happy to help out. Uh, and so, um, you know, Roman was great and, and facilitated that connection. And even though I did not get the chance to do the hotel quarantine one, uh, I'm very lucky to get the chance to do this one. Yeah, I didn't um, know that part of the story, Sam. That's that's funny. It's like it was meant to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it was funny because I was so disappointed when I realized that I, you know, I, I just didn't. The, the stars didn't align for yeah. the uh, hotel quarantine one. But you know, as fate would have it, uh, here we are. Yeah, I, you know, I've been telling everybody that I've been speaking to on some a few the few interviews that I've done since the story broke 
that you're only 30 years old. And, uh, you know, if you read through the transcripts, it's, uh, it, you know, it, it, it really, you know, it, it, your cross-examination was just superb. It was brilliant. And if not for your cross-examination, I don't think we would even have this information. We wouldn't have this. Um, and uh, because some of these witnesses were very hard to break, uh, especially Little. You know, she's, she's an extremely intelligent person. You can, you can tell that from her, her responses. Um, so, you know, I wanted to ask you about that. I wanted to ask you, and, you know, uh, Sam, uh, this is for you, but Sean and Carl, you can jump in as well if you, if you like to answer this. Uh, it became abundantly clear reading through the uh, documents that there really was no scientific rationale for the travel mandate. Did this surprise any of you or is this pretty much what you were expecting from the get-go? We, we suspected it, but it was shocking to hear it coming out of their mouths. Um, and, and again, and, and to go back to Sam, and I'll let him talk more on this, but the, the guy's been, uh, I don't want to blow him up too much here, but he's been a superstar, like amazing, like just absolutely phenomenal. And, and the, like you said, the way that he, the, the work that he put in prior to the cross examinations to be ready to be able to do what you witnessed when you read them is just phenomenal. And, and none of the other lawyers in this case, bar none, uh, bar him did it. So kudos to him. Yeah. I hope um, I'm getting an award at this podcast. <laughs> but, uh, you know what? What I'll, I'll, I'll tell you something. I I I I think the three of us are have a lot of commonalities, and one of the commonalities that we have is that we are we are resilient people, and we I think all three of us in a in a unique way have a resilient past, and the three of us are successful in our own way uh, because of our resilience, and uh, I think my upbringing, the fact that I started my own law firm at 24 or maybe I was 23 at the time, I had to teach myself the law largely. Um, you know, I think that those build skills over time that allow me to do the things that I do today and I'm grateful for it. But in terms of answering your question about the public, the, you know, the scientific basis, it really depends how microscopic you wanna get. And I find that in law, a lot of things depend on how microscopic you wanna get. You can look at a, you can take a look at a 30,000 foot um, level and, and, and come up with a justification. But as soon as you hone in and you try to get a little bit more clarity uh, and more specificity, I find that's where you start to sort of scratch your head and, and, and you're, you're, on the, you're on the pursuit of the search of the rationale. If you, if you take the position as I think the Canadian government has, which is there's a, in, in, out there, there is a public health crisis it is generally desirable to minimize deaths. It is generally desirable to keep everyone healthy. Therefore, we will do whatever we need to do to do that. Um, that's kind of a thousand, uh, 30,000 foot level analysis. Mm -hmm. And, you, you know, frankly, I was expecting a more connected, uh, a more pointed uh, and a lot more clear um, uh, rationale between the specific measures they were doing, i.e. a mandatory vaccination as a precondition for travel and a desired outcome. Uh, and, you know, uh, the, the evidence will speak to itself and it's all in the public record, I would imagine, or most of it is. And that's what we can talk about today. Yeah. Well, uh, again, you know, and this is a question for all three of you. Uh, were you surprised at how cagey these officials were and that at least one of them, the architect of the mandate, uh, Jennifer Little herself, a uh, key actor, I would say, uh, would go so far as to invoke cabinet confidentiality to, sh to shut down questioning? I, I think there were two. What what? What I noticed mm -hmm. was we, all, Sean and I, I mean, Sam had to do the, the hard work of the cross-examination and led all the cross-examinations through that whole six week period. Um, Sean and I sat through all of that and listened and all, some of those cross-examinations are two or three days long um, and across a variety of witnesses and broadly breaking down into two groups, one's group of um, people with, you know, Public Health Agency of Canada, science type backgrounds, and then the political people. And there's definitely a difference when you watch them being cross-examined. Cross and there's there's more of a frankness in the, in the, sci in, in, in the scientists. And an under oath, yes, there were some surprising, some surprising admissions, some certainly from Celia Lorenko, who approved all of the... Uh, vaccines in Canada. Yeah, I mean, there, there are some moments in the cross-examination when you're listening to it that are real sort of wow moments. You, um, When you hear people 
can I see. Think, I think you nailed it. The, the, I but think it it's just, I mean, just on the, the, but the politicians like Jennifer Little and the others, evasive, uh, you know, trying to use talking points rather than answers. And like we watched Sam, you know, probably use 20 questions or 30 questions to actually get to an answer. And you probably read that when you, you know, the, every, the same talking point that, and, and Jennifer Little was obviously very well schooled in that. And you see that through all levels of the liberal government. You see that in parliament, people reading from cards, talking points that are pre-written as answers to questions that they expect to get. Um, so yeah, I mean, disappointment, but no surprises with the political witnesses. Some elements of frankness amongst the scientists where you could sense maybe some of them were getting something off their chest under oath. Yeah, I don't blame them. Interesting. That's a very interesting comment. Um, I, I'm hearing this for the first time. That's uh, one way of looking at it. Because, uh, you know, I was reading through the transcripts as well. And, you know, I was wondering, well, I expected them to be a little more sophisticated than this, at least at least a couple of these people, uh, and I won't name them here, but um, but it was, yeah, it, it was a bit surprising uh, that, you know, that they were uh, finally just gave in and just said, look, yeah, you know what, I wouldn't, we wouldn't have done this under these conditions, for example, or some sort, so, something or the other along those lines. But, um, you know, I realized that the case is before the courts and the, and, you know, at this point, no matter how the case goes, all three of you, in my opinion, have already done a great public service, as I say in my story, in a sense, you've already won. Um, but um, the fact that, you know, we have all this information out there in the public domain, thanks to your efforts, do you feel that at this stage, at this interim stage, um, that uh, the public, uh, you, do you get some sense of satisfaction that the public uh, at least knows more than we did a few few weeks ago? Wow. Yeah, a lot. <laughs> they... I think Carl nailed it there. Sorry to interrupt you, Carl, when you were talking, but he, he nailed it in the fact that they, it, there were two very, it was very d distinctive between the expert witnesses and the lay witnesses, the lay witnesses being the sort of bureaucrats or government witnesses. Um, yeah, it, it was very noticeable. And, and like Carl said, it, it, it came across that if, if you went in and and you sort of drilled them hard enough on those questions. Eventually, it was like, yeah, you know what, you know, it. it again, maybe it was. Um, uh, what's the word? Uh, maybe they just sort of just getting it, like Carl said, getting it off their chest, perhaps. And uh, whereas the bureaucrats are very sneaky, very, very elusive um, to the questions. And and these are just my observations. Obviously we, we watched every cross examination. We were the only two applicants that did watch the uh, cross examinations. And it was very interesting to watch the different characters and, and just how, again, those two that's, groups of people. That's very interesting. So you were the only two applicants watching the cross examination. Why did the other applicants not want to participate in the case and the proceedings? I don't know. Maybe they Do you know. Do no, no. We have to ask them. I, I, yeah. Okay. That's yeah. That's interesting. Um, yeah, Sam. Do you um, do you, do you have a sense of satisfaction that uh, these documents are now out there and the case is now getting some attention? Undoubtedly, but I have a bigger satisfaction that two people took it upon themselves uh, to make time in their professional life and in their personal life. Um, to make the commitment to do what they've done in order for the public to get access to the type of information that, quite frankly, probably will only ever come from an adversarial context like this. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is there is a price to play. There's a there's a price to play. And uh, for many people, it's, it's an unattainable price, but it's an important price to pay if we want to continue to have a robust democracy. And I think that what uh, what Sean has done and what Carl has done is uh, is a big service um, to the country, quite frankly. Yeah. Well, that leads me to my next question. And uh, really, any one of you can answer this uh, more broadly. What do you think that this mandate uh, tells us about the state of individual liberty in Canada? It's been suspended, but they could bring it back. Um, uh, and we've been told that they could potentially bring it back. Um, where do you think we're going? And are you hopeful for the future? I think you know, it's a, that's such a good question. I mean, and, and that's so prefacing it with something from your previous question, yes, there's a sense of satisfaction that this is out there, but neither Sean nor I nor Sam are in this for sort of fame and, and glory. I, I think that this, the, 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 the question, you're, this question, I mean, you're, 
it, the case has much broader implications, as you realize. And, and I worry that the lack of real mainstream media coverage in Canada has left a lot of people in, in the dark about what these mandates were really about. And I, I think that was a government tactic, was to prevent people from getting all of the information. And it leaves, it leaves all Canadians on a slippery slope, frankly. Yeah. You know, yes. that if, if the government's able to create this kind of discrimination in this instance on against six or seven million Canadians um, who just on the basis of a completely routine health choice, yeah. um, then if they're allowed to get away with that, if they do get away with that, if Canadians find that acceptable um, in some way, then in the future, there's a very serious risk that that same um, kind of policy comes back in different ways and it, it's it's usually foolish to watch some to watch another person be persecuted imagining that that might not be you and and i think both all the three of us feel that the case is very important it's very important to be heard and we hope that happens and it's fantastic and very important you can win it yeah. and it's very important that the information gets into the public domain so that if the at least some more Canadians start to realize a little bit more about about the background to this case, the policies, the risks to them, the risks to their freedoms um, going forward. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's not just it's 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 not only um it's not only about people who chose not to be injected, right? It's about everybody and, and it is it's scary. It's a scary thought. It's a scary thought that, that this mootness motion could potentially, which I'm sure we'll get into in a minute, could potentially have all of these four cases dismissed. Um, and the, the, the thought of the thought of that happening, as I said, it, it's it's a scary thought. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, you know, sec Mobility rights are so fundamental uh, to human, you know, dignity and, and, and integrity. Uh, I, you know, Sh Sean and Carl and I had a conversation a couple of days ago. We were trying to think of a circumstance in which it might ever be acceptable to really restrict someone's mobility, absent than the obvious somebody might have a criminal record, you know, so on and so forth, extradition, these types of outlet, not outlier cases, but obviously not what we're well, not not what's being contemplated in this discourse, right? And frankly, I couldn't imagine one. Because the second you start limiting an individual's ability to move, whether it's for a pandemic or war or whatever the case might be, it's effectively the government telling you, we know better than you what, where you should be going. And I don't think that's an outcome from a political philosophy perspective that should ever be tolerated uh, because I don't think that can ever be true. Uh, you know, certain measures need to be taken for, for people's protection and safety. And, and, you know, there's many instances where the state does know and, and is acting on great information and acting, you know, for the collective welfare of people. And you have to make some compromises day to day that are practical. But asking, asking people to make an irreversible decision as a precondition to enjoying one of the most fundamental human rights uh, I think we have on this planet, certainly in a Western democracy, you know, that, that gives me a lot of pause for concern. <laughs>